kids that go to the skate park for the first time, I think that they see the daredevil antics and the excitement and the vibe. Even if they're not there to skate, they're drawn to it. And when people find it, they're stuck in it. Skateboarding is an expression to who somebody is. It's just an outlet. It's really an independent sport, if you would call it, but we never called skateboarding like a sport. It's always been like up to you. Well, skateboarding has come a long way, and it's easy to forget how scarce it was in the early days, the lack of skate parks, the lack of inclusion, and nowadays there are skate parks everywhere, and everyone's welcome to skate, and the mainstream embraces skateboarding as legitimate. None of that stuff happened when I was a kid, and a lot of that is San Diego's contributions to the current state of skateboarding. I'm proud of San Diego as being this incubator for skateboarding where it just it started here you know it's like Hawaiians being proud of, of surfing you know surfing started in Hawaii they should be proud of that it's part of their culture skateboarding is part of our culture as San Diegans we should be proud of the history and that a lot of things started here every skate park has a history Sometimes you're so focused on the skateboarding, you forget about this whole foundation underneath. And it sort of makes you realize that if it wasn't for where you're born and raised, you might not have been introduced to the whole world through skateboarding. That can unite all of us together. And it's almost like we all have something in common. You can see it through skateboarding. The history of skateboarding in San Diego goes way back, and it's as rich as it is complicated. You know, all over the USA, these small pockets of surfers were taking what they were doing in the water and applying it to land. It really was these small pockets of surf scenes that kind of gave way to skateboarding. But it wasn't till really 1974, 1975, San Diego really started to push things forward with some big groundbreaking events that basically changed the landscape of skateboarding forever. Yeah, I mean, really back then, but it was more surf skating, if anything. We were trying to surf on our skateboards because that just went together. You know, you could do surf style on a skateboard and carve hills and do it in a surfing-like kind of movement. All the surfers would ride them down to the beach for transportation, really. It got to the point where all the major surf companies had a skateboard uh, model. The early companies would be like Hobie and Gordon and Smith, Bain. It was a, a kind of a natural thing, really, to happen. But the equipment wasn't where it is now, obviously. You know, skateboards were a toy before, pretty much, and, and it was hard to do things. When, when I look at photos of the boards they were riding, I mean, you're just like, wow, that's crazy that they could do that on that board. You know, I can barely stand on that board. They're tiny, they're skinny, the trucks can't handle a lot of torque. I started on clay with ball bearings. They're great going straight and doing like doo doo doo, but when you got speed and crank a turn, they just slide out. 
it was very limited on what you could do because clay is very hard and they don't grip. Well, I guess they got them from, from roller skate wheels, right? And they were some sort of composite plastic thing or something. They just didn't work. You know, this was a time where skaters were trying to ride on metal and clay wheels, and it looked super dangerous and really hard to ride. So in 1973, Frank Nasworthy started a business in Encinitas, California, making urethane skateboard wheels after seeing the potential for a better way to skate. He eventually called the business Cadillac because of the smoothness of this ride. I started selling wheels in April of 1973 out of the back of my Dodge Dart. The first year, I did about 40,000 wheels. And then the next year, it was in the hundreds of thousands. So San Diego was the birthplace of where urethane meets skateboards. The urethane wheel was the flashpoint that changed skateboarding forever. The minute that skaters got themselves on urethane wheels, everything changed. It was almost like the whole world opened up to them. Now you could go over little rocks and they would grip. You wouldn't hurt yourself. So it made skateboarding what it is today, bar none. I mean, there's no comparison. It's pretty incredible that even years later, we're still basically riding the same type of urethane wheels that they were riding way back in the day. So this is an invention that really opened up a world of possibilities for skaters. It was really neat when I started skating because I grew from the clay wheel into the urethane revolution and watched equipment evolve. Tracker Trucks was here in North County and they developed the first skateboard wider truck. That gave you stability and enabled you to be able to do more radical type skating maneuvers. It happened fast. People started being able to do more radical things because the equipment did progress pretty quickly. A big part of the skateboard industry, you know, emerged out of San Diego and some of the new technologies it really opened up a whole new world for skateboarders. You suddenly had control of your skateboard. The board would stay under you. Really introduced this aggressive new style that then was adapted to them, these new terrains that were a little bit more challenging. Kids took this device in anywhere where there was asphalt and in particular hills. From that emerged local groups of skaters who would meet up in La Costa and other places where you know there was fresh new asphalt and very little traffic. It was awesome. The pavement on Black Hill in 74 was like butter. The asphalt was top notch. It was so wide and nobody cared. We weren't intruding, we weren't trespassing. It was public streets. And I just went, this is just cool. It didn't take long for I figured I'm not just gonna watch. So then I started skating and then more and more people showed up. Every Sunday were the races, but people were skating every day there. The thing that was really the clue to me is that Florida came to La Costa, Dogtown came to La Costa. So clearly there was a hub of something happening. The place just exploded with good ideas and then tangible product to look, see, ride. It's just like sharing the knowledge and sharing the stoke. And it was a lot of fun for a long time. But you can imagine if you're gonna go down on something like this, you leave your DNA behind. I did a little bit of that downhill stuff, but to me, that's like daredevilness, you know? Like, I don't like this anymore. <laughs> so I immediately got out of that and started skating in the pools and the ditches. We used to skate in these ditches because we could traverse and have something that would hold us up on an embankment. It was so much more like surfing a wave. A big part of skateboarding in the early days was emulating surfing because you were, you were carving and so they were emulating waves. People who surfed had the same sort of mentality as people who skated. 
especially back in those days, it wasn't widely accepted as an activity or a sport. And so you had to go to different remote places, inaccessible places to do it. I heard about these big pipes out in the Arizona desert. So I frequented it and we'd go out there and camp. And these pipes were 20 foot wide, 20 foot in diameter, two foot concrete. We would skate these sections and it would be like surfing 20 foot surf, front side and back side, and we'd just go boom. Just like this on both sides, you know. And that was something, man, you know. You know, that sensation was just too good not to create. Tom's first inclination was probably to figure out a way to steal one of these pipes out of the desert, but obviously that was not going to be possible. So for him, he decided to recreate it the best way he could back home in San Diego. At the time, I was doing carpentry work, so I kind of knew how to frame stuff. I took that exact dimension of the radius because it was so perfect. Tom was inspired. You can imagine Tom and his friends basically just trying to figure out how to form something similar to what they were riding in the desert. So they had wood, they had nails and hammers, and a lot of imagination. Tom called the ramp Rampage. And from that, the birth of the skateboarding half pipe. That was the original half pipe in Encinitas, first one ever built. As far as I know, you know, if somebody can claim the fame before that, I'd like to meet them and, and shake their hand. But I didn't copy anybody, that's for sure, you know. It was a primitive ramp, no decks, no flat bottom, basically half a pipe. But back then, it was a new invention. So what we all know today as a skateboarding half pipe came to fruition in a, an unlikely place. Uh, really the birth of DIY skateboarding. You gotta wonder what the, the neighbors thought of that at first when these kids were out there, this big wooden half pipe that probably looked very dangerous to a passerby, but to a skater, well, this thing looked perfect and everybody wanted a piece. There was a zoo at my house. I mean, on any given day, there'd be, you know, 20, 30 people wanting to come over and skate. I'd wake up in the morning, there'd be guys hanging out, you know. I, to be honest with you, I only went there a few times because it was a full on boys scene. The boys, you know what I'm saying? So I showed up and rode it maybe for a couple hours, maybe two or three times. There was the one time I showed up, there's probably, you know, 20, 30 boys, and I just was like the only girl, and I was like, you know, yeah, you know, I'll just ride it for real quick. And it was hard to get going at first, right? Because it was really wide. Just took it to another level, really. And things just kept getting better and better and harder and harder and more radical. We got a lot of notoriety about this ramp. People want to know how to build one. So that's when I got together with my brother and he drew up a set of complete working plans. And we started reproducing blueprints and we sold tens of thousands of these ramp plans. All around the world, Japan, Korea, Germany, people were building skateboard ramps and I couldn't believe it. And they were all rampage from rampage plans. You know, the little ramp in Encinitas, California, basically became the literal blueprint for skateboarders all over the world for them to replicate on their own. I lived there for about three years, you know, and skated it every day. And, and you know, that's when this whole skate park thing came in. And obviously the first skate park, from what I know, was the Carlsbad Skate Park. And, John O'Malley, you know, he was instrumental in it. And I did a little bit of stuff there, you know, worked there a little bit. The most famous of the original skate parks was the Carlsbad Skate Park. An entrepreneur at the time had this idea of creating a business around skateboarding, which was growing. And he hired a young surfer to design a custom facility. You know, at that point there was no precedent, so they had to build it from scratch. They had to conceive it from scratch. The term skate park 
was coined with the design of that park. You know, in the corner of that diagram is the word skate park, and possibly that's the first time it was ever written down. Well, it's crazy to think of a world before skate parks, but in the mid 70s, the word hadn't even been invented yet. There were no parks dedicated to skateboarding. Uh, that all changed in 1976 when the Carlsbad Skate Park opened its doors. The first time I saw Carlsbad Skate Park, it was like, oh my God, look at that. It really is a skate park. Let's go! We, and we spent all days skating for at least eight hours. It was so fun. It was another dimension of skateboarding in a skate park. The sensation of dropping into the bowl and carving it, it was perfect because everything was smooth transition. And it was like everybody was out there. It was just the place to be. The Carlsbad Skate Park was really nothing like the skate parks you'd see today, more of a flowing cement surf style course. The skaters that went there in early days actually progressed way beyond the boundaries of the park pretty quickly. On the business side of things, people saw what was possible, build a skate park, make it fun and interesting. Skaters will pay you to ride it. You know, the original Carlsbad Skate Park was clearly a success. All of a sudden, budding entrepreneurs saw an opportunity. You know, after Carlsbad, as the other parks began to open, they were offering more and more challenging terrain because they wanted to one-up each other and attract more of those skaters to their park. In its wake, skate parks began to open that were all packed and kids were skating all over the place. Which by some estimates numbered in three or 400 skate parks. The parks that opened up after Carlsbad took their cue from that park, but they evolved the design a little bit or they built something a little bit larger. It all happened really pretty fast. I mean, it went from surfing to carving downhill to carving a bowl and then I can get out of the bowl. Well, in the early days when I really fell in love with skateboarding, it had already evolved from just sidewalk surfing to pool skating. So by the time I started, people were already doing aerials out of bowls. Well, I was born in San Diego because my dad was in the Navy and he was stationed here and then retired here. As I grew up here and fell in love with skating, I realized that this was one of the best places you could be a skateboarder. When I went to the park, it was just this hub of creativity. I mean, not just skateboarding, style, music, fashion, like a way of thinking, a way of approaching life. It was all very do-it-yourself. And that's what drew me in. But it was pretty obvious Skateboarding was mostly boys, men. You rarely saw girls at the skate park. It just didn't seem like something girls chose to do or were for some reason discouraged by it. Going to a skate park, it was mostly the guys skating. 75% of the time I was at the skate parks, I would be the only girl there. There are a few girls that did start crossing over in the parks and trying to do the pools. But really, there weren't a lot of girls skating. There was not. But then they built Delmore Skateboard Ranch, and I was the resident pro there when they first opened it. And I was there like five days a week. I started working there the second day they were open. I was the worker bee, you know, sweeping out pools, checking people in to skate. Those were the days when it was 100 people skating. I mean, it was really packed. So at the time, yeah, skateboarding was huge. Like every kid I knew had a skateboard, but I wasn't allowed to do it. So it was like this like, uh, thing, you know, like I couldn't touch it, but I really wanted it. And that was the beginning of the park explosion. You know, we had a lot of skate parks in San Diego, Carlsbad, Vista, and then Del Mar. So the skate park opened I needed to get my parents to sign a waiver to skate there. 
I think my mom was holding it over my head, like, I'm not citing anything. <laughs> I'm like, come on. And then, you know, I probably cried a thousand times and until it was just basically they submitted. And they, sub they pushed me into a life of skateboarding. I just remember all these parks were popping up. There was one in Spring Valley, there was one at their Oasis, and unfortunately, my mom wasn't gonna take me anywhere. She wasn't, she wasn't taking me to Spring Valley. I, I think she took me to Oasis one time, but how do I say it? Being a girl, she didn't want me skateboarding. But then, you know, Del Mar opened. I begged her, begged her, begged her to take me to Del Mar, and she did, so. First time I skated, I was horrible. Couldn't figure it out. I was just like, are you kidding me? This is so weird. And I'm watching people going, how are they doing this? And the next time I came back, I, was, I just got it. It just clicked immediately. I think for a lot of us young skaters at the time, it simply spoke to us. And unlike other sports, it was really something we could, you know, grab a hold of and that it clearly had a hold on us. It wasn't just something we did, it was who we were. Back then, the people that had started the skate parks, a lot of them were just investors, you know, and they just didn't have a connection to skateboarding. So, and Del Mar, the, the people that owned it had no connection to skateboarding. Well, it was called Surf and Turf Recreation, and it was a group of doctors and, you know, professionals from Orange County. Del Mar Skate Park, it's a golf ranch. It's a bunch of golfers. They come over and look at it and go, uh, uh, and go back over and whack a little balls in a hole, right? <laughs> so they, they, but they own the property and they realized that all the kids wanted to be there. Hell, oh, there's money to be made. So it was a business. And yes, there's a lot of people in skateboard industry, period, who are not skateboarders, but they are money investors. They see there's money to be made. You definitely had to have people with money to back it because it was very expensive to lay cement like that. This was the era of pay to play skateboarding. It truly became a business at this time. Build a park, skaters come skate it, they pay, repeat. From design to construction, that didn't always match up in the early days of skate parks. A lot of times you would have a thought of what the park was gonna be like, but after it was built, it was an entirely different beast. You know, we saw skate parks that were poorly designed, uh, hastily built, that ended up being downright dangerous for some skaters. By 1979, you had a number of skate parks that were very challenging. And as new skateboarders were coming in to the latest fad, they were going to these places and trying to learn how to skateboard at these, you know, pro level facilities. And inevitably, you know, several of them were getting injured and the insurance for these skate parks started to get really expensive. From what I remember, when the skate park opened in 1978, uh, insurance was like $11,000 a year. By the end of it, it was like a, over 100000 a year. I think that set a precedent for the future where we knew that skateboarding went up and down like this, the popularity of skateboarding, because it was a fad. No, it really was a blur. Watching it collapse around you and there's nothing you can do, I mean, it's just heartbreaking. You know, in that time span, there were probably hundreds of skate parks in the US and it all dwindled down to three that were still businesses. I don't remember the gradual downturn. I just remember all of a sudden it's like, wow, there's nobody here. It went from 100 people skating to two people skating. You just thought it just died. When I first started skating in the late 70s, it was a boom of skating. And there were skate parks all over San Diego. And so I was excited, like, once I'm old enough, I'm going to all those parks, Spring Valley and Escondido, and, and they all closed within a year. 
the last two skate parks remaining in San Diego were Del Mar Skate Ranch and Oasis Skate Park. It was pretty obvious from just the crowd and the vibe at Oasis that it was going to close, and it eventually did, and then Del Mar was the only park. Del Mar was the only park in San Diego. At some point, Del Mar was the only park in Southern California. You know, the last of the original San Diego skate parks was the Del Mar Skateboard Ranch, but people in San Diego rarely knew that A, that it existed, and B, certainly where it was, even when he described where it was. Oh, it's near the racetrack. We were sort of tucked away, and eventually the skate park came under the management of the golf shop, which was really the, the profitable business there. And they kept it open for some reason, and I was trusted to help run this place. They trusted a 20-something-year-old skater to run this arcade, skate park, miniature golf, snack bar, and I don't know why. I, I didn't have anything else to do. And we were doing anything to get people into skate. And then you always expected, you know, this could be the last day. I don't think skateboarding was even really on anybody's radar in San Diego. Like, other than people that wanted to skate. You know, at Del Mar, uh, it was kind of obvious that there was nobody skating there. Like, whenever I'd go, it was just like six or seven people at the most. Like, that was a crowded weekend, you know, in 1981. Started skating there all the time. You know, skating there for four or five hours. You'd learn something, and, and, and you just got to know all these people that had the same, they were, they were loving the same thing, you know? Even up here back then, there wasn't a whole lot going on in the North County, San Diego. So it wasn't as if I could go down the street and there's skaters everywhere. So the skate park, that was it. This is what you had. Felt like it, like every weekend you'd start seeing more people, you know, so 83, all of San Diego would come to the skate park on the weekends, you know, like, so you, then you'd have 20 people there, you know, of all different ages, and we were the Del Mar locals. It was hard to see that all over the country, skateboarding was continuing to recede and shrink. It's just that that one place happened to be where all the remaining skateboarders started to concentrate. Somebody told me, they go, hey, did you see that kid, Tony Hawk, skating? He's from Oasis, because Oasis Skate Park, it had closed down. So Tony was a local there, and his dad started bringing him up to Del Mar. So I went out to watch him, and you know, he could do stuff, but he wasn't a standout or anything. And then just, he would come every day after school. And that was his life, was to, he'd get out of school, go straight to Del Mar. And then Tony just got better and better and better. But because of the state of skateboarding, it wasn't like you held him up like, you know, that guy's the next Tony Hawk. You know, it, was, it wasn't like that. It was just this skater who was better than other skaters. The first day uh, skating the skate ranch, as I remember it, Tony rolls in. He comes flying out of the pool, like up to my eye level, and I'm hearing the sound of the wheels leaving the concrete and spinning freely in the air. That that, <laughs> and that was just like, wow. He worked for it definitely, but he was definitely a prodigy. I could just tell he had the talent, he had the drive. But yeah, he was so far ahead of me that it was just like, oh my God, I could not believe the stuff he was doing. Tony was just on his own thing. It was like you could see this whole new era coming when you saw Tony skate. Like, oh, is this how it's gonna be? <sighs> it's hard to explain to people who don't skate. 
you know, when I'm on my skateboard, that's when I'm in complete control of my destiny, of everything around me. Sometimes you'll try something, it's just an idea, and you're learning it because you know it's possible, and that's the goal. People think like, I see kids and they're just trying kickflips for hours. Like, why? And it's because every little bit you're learning along the way. You're making little adjustments. Maybe they're not perceived by the naked eye, but you're getting a little bit closer. You know it's possible. You know you could do it. And eventually, you put all your effort into it, and you do it. And for me, that has always been the central quest of skateboarding is new tricks. I was skating with people every day who were really creating what it was about to become. I knew that this kid next to me, Tony, was just blowing minds with what he was doing, but he was blowing minds of the people standing around that bowl in the park, not anywhere, anyone beyond that. It was just a matter of time before people took notice. When I was in high school, I hid my skateboard, usually in the bushes outside of school, just so I wasn't carrying it around, so I wasn't, there wasn't a reason to make fun of me. If I wasn't at school, I was at the skate park until it closed. <laughs> like, absolutely. I was there at all hours and then go home, go to sleep, wake up, go to school, start the day over. It was just that common bond of everybody there didn't really fit in anywhere else. By the time I got there in 81, was the same crew that you would see all the time. And so it became a, an, an extended family. I mean, their kids would come there for eight hours and not leave the skate park. And I look back at it now and I just go, wow, we had it made. We, we had a skate park to ourselves, you know? And we could do whatever we wanted as long as we didn't set the place on fire. You know, I picked up skate photography when I was working there. There I started shooting photos just for fun. And then I had all these people to practice on. It was all a big blank canvas and we were just figuring out what we could do with our skateboards. It did seem like every week new tricks were being developed. Not just by me, I mean by all the skaters. As a skateboarder, you earned respect at the skate park for the risks you took and the things you achieved by your own merit, by your own efforts. And it wasn't so important that you were the best skater or anything, it was that you were pushing yourself. When I first started skating Del Mar, and I didn't have any female friends that skated, but for me, it didn't matter. We were all good friends. Growing up at the skate park, I felt like that was my second home. Like seriously, all those guys, I feel lots of love for, you know. <laughs> Nobody cared who you were. Nobody cared where you came from. Whether you were rich, poor, black, white, brown, green, yellow, nobody cared, you were just skaters. It was so unique and so rad that like everybody was just like loving the same thing, you know? And at this point, you know, I felt like a loner and skateboarding was kind of like, oh, come on in, loners. It just felt really, really good to be part of that. <laughs> the tennis club people used to call it, can you turn your music down? No, no, we, we would have to or else we'd get in trouble from the main boss. There was definitely some disputes over territory. The golfers hated us. The golfers, like, one end was the skate park, the other end was the, was the, <laughs> the driving range, and those two did not meet very often. We were total outcasts. They felt like we were rebels or whatever, and some of us were, some of us weren't, you know? I'm not really into rules a lot. I like breaking rules, but when I was the manager, I tried to take care of the skate park. And I think we knew that we were fortunate. We were trying not to blow it. 
Well, my dad saw that there was this group of skaters devoted to doing it with really no organization. So he started the Castle uh, organization, California Amateur Skateboard League, and eventually formed the NSA, National Skateboarding Association, to start sanctioning events at different parks. So he was the leader in just trying to bring the industry together. You know, at that time, skateboarding was so small that any opportunity for skateboarders to get together was celebrated. If there was an event, you went just to be there and just to see who was there and to see the skateboarding going on. When the Del Mar contests came around, it was sort of like the last of the summer series. It was definitely the event that everybody was at. That was where you got to see the pinnacle of skateboarding by the best skateboarders in the world. And in Tony's case, the record speaks for itself. He was the clear-cut winner of all of those events. He was winning contests. He was the guy. And we want our guy to win. No, nothing got past him. Tony was the, the guy. As I started to get more successful in the skate world, people would come there expecting to see me, and most likely, I was gonna be there. <laughs> you know, I hear that all the time. Yeah, man, I went to Del Mar, I was hoping you'd be there, and there you were, right in the keyhole. Like, yeah, I lived there. You know, the Del Mar Skate Ranch was really special because we all had that place to meet up, and you just had to go there, and you, you just meet new people who all had that same interest, that same passion for this one thing. Del Mar Skate Ranch became this mecca for skateboarders from all over the world. You know, it basically, I don't wanna say it saved skateboarding, but it definitely gave people a place to go where you could see Tony Hawk flying, you could see all the rad things that went on there. Love skateboarding, hate skateboarding. It changed a lot of people's minds. Well, I'm from Illinois and I'm out here for the winter, so this is the first time I've ever seen anything like this. Oh, they're crazy. I mean, it's good exercise and good sport for the kids. I'm glad they're doing it. It became a destination. So anyone that skated was going to congregate there from all over. And, and so on any given day, there'd be people from other countries or way out of town that made the pilgrimage because that was the skate park. That's where the skate scene was. Word spread of skateboarding in a truly organic way, but it wasn't until Transworld Skateboarding came along that the world finally began to see what was happening. Transworld Magazine was in Oceanside, and so if you were skating Del Mar and doing something special, it was more likely that you were gonna get coverage because it was easy for them. I consumed myself with skateboarding information, and what educated me was Thrasher and Transworld Magazine my first recollection of the scene, um, you know, of the skateboard scene, it was all about Del Mar, you know what I mean? It was like, that was the epicenter of skateboarding. They were trying to cover all the newest tricks, all the events, and so anything that was put in the magazine was for the rest of the skate world to aspire to, basically. You know, before the internet, there was nothing else. Being a photographer, I wanted to bring skateboarding to them, you know? Because some people, when you live in Denmark or someplace, everything you see is from a magazine, and that was their connection to the skateboard world. Maybe Transworld added a lot to the mystique of Del Mar. I think that was one of the great services of the magazine in particular, was getting out there into the rest of the world and showing people what skateboarding was really about. Me and like four friends actually skated from the Oceanside Pier to Del Mar. There was a contest taking place. Started early in the morning and just took the coast highway all the way. That's probably roughly 20 miles. None of us had memberships. We hung out there for a day. We snuck in and um, we took the bus back home. <laughs> I didn't have a membership to Del Mar because my father being as busy as he was, he wasn't going to you know, take me to get that. And so it was an aspirational thing for me to be a member at Del Mar and you know, never having to really officially do it was kind of a bummer. By 1986, skateboarding was growing pretty fast at that point. It was an interesting shift in perspective. Skateboarding had become 
focus on ramps, at least at the competitive level. I started traveling a lot for competitions. I was skating other backyard ramps, and it was almost like, for lack of a better word, I kind of grown out of Del Mar's style of skating. I know a lot of the pros, Tony and others, were traveling quite a bit, and most of the contests at that point were being held in arenas all over the world. It's ironic that the skate park would close during a pretty dramatic upswing in interest in skateboarding. I think it closed sometime in June of 80, 1987. And, uh, we didn't really get much information that that was going to happen. It was just like two days before it's going to close. And so then it was like reality, like, wait, what? Your whole world had just been like, and there was not going to be anything, like, you're done. It's over. I mean, there were, there were a lot of people who were, you know, I considered really good friends who I'd see at the skate park every day. And once it closed, I, I literally have never seen them again. You know, I think a lot of people just, without the skate park, just kind of faded into other parts of their lives. I do remember it closing. I think that took a little while to, to really hit, but I think the last time I skated Del Mar was probably a month or so before they closed it down and tore it down. And, um, and then after that, I didn't skate for 23 years, I think. When I knew Delmar was closed, it was like, well, I don't really miss skating there. I just miss being there. And that stuck with me for a long time. But yeah, I mean, by that time, I was already traveling the world and going on tours and skating international competitions. And, and so Delmar was sort of left in the dust anyway. There was definitely a scattering of the tribes. People didn't have each other's phone numbers. It wasn't like, it was like everybody got together and had like a paddle out and we all gave each other our numbers. Like, here you go, man, I'm gonna miss you. Or yearbooks, none of that. It was, whoa, everybody's gone. You know, I think for locals, losing Del Mar was simply losing the clubhouse, losing the place where everybody got together. The local skateboarding community kind of lost its, its glue, really. They suddenly didn't have a place to get together, so they just skated their own stuff, and they built their own ramps. Every scene had their local ramp, or two or three or whatever, and we started making vert ramps in local backyards that probably stuck around for about a couple of months at a time. Everybody started building ramps, so it just went from skate parks to ramps, and then backyard ramps, and there were no public ramps. It sucked because at that point, now we had to start calling people. And I remember the, the next place to skate vert was the Fallbrook ramp. You'd go there and everybody would be there. Like all the Del Mar locals would be there and the decks are packed. So I'm like, oh, cool, I can skate here all the time. No, you can't skate here all the time. There's rules, there's you know certain times that you can go here. You're, you gotta call. Like I don't wanna ever have to call anybody Hey, can I come skate your ramp? And here, no, I'm not skating today. Because that, to me, like, I want to skate today, now. Backyard ramps only lasted a short while because neighbors complained of the noise and the chaos. And even then, there were so few ramps and they were impossible to maintain. And so skaters took to the streets. Skating out in the streets, it made skateboarding more accessible than having to get a membership or having to find a friend with a ramp. Kids wanted to establish places to skate, and so I felt like it was really a refreshing time to just grab your board and enjoy the journey to and from wherever it is that you're going. I know that a lot of people were resorted to schoolyards, you know, when Del Mar shut down. There was a lot of, you know, schoolyards, a lot of downtown areas. We were searching for anything, anything that was skatable. And we'd just be on missions, like on our backpacks to find new train to skate, you know? 
Back then it was mainly stairs and then like little handrails and, and gaps. Suddenly the world was their playground and they weren't confined to the skate park or the backyards. And that changed everything. That really is what made skateboarding rise up again. Anything was skatable at that point. A wall, a curb, a handrail. For me, it was like kind of a turning point where I was like, this is starting to become a thing, you know? And then a year later, I started working at Transworld. And to their credit, they started really pushing street skating. There was so much good skating in those magazines. It actually was kind of exciting for me to be there and then to shoot it, you know? Like, I felt like, oh, I'm on the forefront of this. Let's go with it, you know? The style of skating evolved very rapidly then. So people started to realize that they could go down the handrails and they could do bigger gaps. I mean, that jump was very quick. Back in those days, people just cared about street skating. And then the magazines kind of followed because we want to do what all the skaters are doing. I think Transworld Skateboard Magazine helped to kind of usher in a new era of skateboarding, I guess. It was really responsible for presenting skateboard culture and the scene in San Diego, you know, to the rest of the world. It would basically be like a brochure to San Diego skate spots. You know, you'd open the magazine, you'd look through, oh, there's a rail in downtown San Diego. Uh, there's a schoolyard in North County. Uh, there's a ledge in Rancho Bernardo. I mean, it was all in the magazine because it was all happening right here. You could see that like San Diego was like turning heads and like making it like, this is the, can I, can we go here? I, I can't really explain why. This is, it must have been where it was happening. And you know, it, and it was happening here. It's amazing to think that some of the most famous skate spots in the world are things that most people walk by and use for the purpose they were intended for, and they don't think twice about it. Inevitably, there were locations that became iconic because skaters did certain tricks that were documented and published. People all over the world came to know these basic features of an industrial park or a schoolyard in the San Diego area. A lot of these places were the driving force of the skateboard scene when they were around. And being that these skate spots were showcased in Transworld magazine, it really highlighted San Diego as the epicenter of skateboarding. We tried to show other places. We were called Transworld Skateboarding, and there wasn't a lot of Transworld going on lots of times. It was a lot of San Diego and California. And it's just what we ran, and that's what kids saw around the world. There's just like so many spots built perfectly for skateboarding. Point Loma High School, City College, San Aguido, and the Carl's Bad Gap. To be able to do something on one of these monument spots that no one's done, it's a huge accomplishment. You know, that's when I realized like, oh, these are like destination spots like that have been on the cover of this magazine, it is now a proving ground that if you did it there, you were looked upon as like one of the best in skateboarding. It's a one-up contest, it's super competitive, and skateboarding is all about technicality. You know, the tricks are, they're either big or they're technical. You've got to come up with a new trick to get it in the mag. This is I don't want another call. Do you understand? Don't go to another bank. Don't go to some 7-Eleven parking lot. Go to a school. Go somewhere where there's no business or no people. All right, you're out of here. No more calls today. As skateboarding took to the streets, it became more and more obvious that it was considered an illegal activity and that you were trespassing on, <laughs> on, on property. Everywhere I went, I was confronted with signs that literally told me no skateboarding, no skateboarding. And I think that was the case for most skateboarders. They just view skaters as just troublemakers trying to like 
ruin property and make racket, you're gonna look at it as a crime. Yeah, I was breaking the law every day shooting photos. And it's usually at a business or a schoolyard. The police would look at it as just a nuisance that you were there. When skating got really popular, then there was more security guards, more signs, more skate stoppers, more police. They'd be mad, and I, I knew why they, why they were mad, and I know why a business was, a business owner was mad. You know, you're either, you know, disrupting their business or destroying their property. It was just, it was a weird place. And these were dedicated young athletes who were essentially outlawed by virtue of the fact they were pursuing something that didn't have a sanctioned place. You know, if, if you're a skateboarder, I mean, for the longest time, I mean, you're an outlaw because quite essentially it was illegal to skate anywhere. That was a big intriguing thing about skateboarding because it wasn't an organized sport. You know what I mean? It was a culture, it was a lifestyle. It was rebellious by nature because you had to sneak and hop the fence in order to skate. You know, skateboarding had really changed at that point. The barrier to entry was, was pretty intense and pretty high. Um, it was an intimidating thing to take on as a, as a kid, I think. I think that the passion overrides the risk. I mean, the risk of getting in trouble, not just the risk of your body. As much as skateboarding is an individual pursuit, there is a collective celebration and push for people who, who test the limits. You have to be in a certain mind state to be creative enough to try a trick over and over and over again. It's a mental battle with yourself. You don't get to take the shortcuts. You're gonna fall, you're gonna take the beat downs. You know, going through that can be really frustrating and can almost make you feel like a failure and that you're not good enough. Professionals are not. People can't even really see what they're capable of when they're capable of so much more. There's times where you're like, I'll never land this and nobody can help you out but yourself. In the early 90s, mid 90s, there was hardly any career to be made in skateboarding. Even if you were a top pro, it was minimal. So it wasn't a career choice. It was more you did it because you loved it. And sure, maybe, maybe you made some board royalties, but there was no other sponsorships happening. Nothing that was mainstream. It was all just skate brands. But by that time, skate culture was considered more street culture. By the mid 90s, skateboarding had a bit of a resurgence in interest. And like the companies that made skateboards and wheels and other hard goods, the shoe brands could appeal to a much broader market because unlike a skateboard, everybody needs a pair of shoes. <laughs> and some footwear brands based here in San Diego, you know, Osiris shoes, DC shoes, became very, very successful. I got the design for DC shoes in its heyday. And a lot of those guys were you know, taking home big checks. I mean, I don't know exact figures, but I mean, let's say a quarter million to, you know, three quarters of a million dollars a year. Those shoe brands became the cool brands. And that's how you identified a skater. Were they wearing DC or Osiris? The, the shoe movement became bigger than skateboard sales. And people that didn't skate saw skating as becoming cool. And that's kind of when you knew that, you know, skateboarding was permeating and influencing, you know, a larger part of popular culture. It was so awesome because there was so much new stuff going on. And it seemed like all of a sudden people started catching on to it, like that were outside of skateboarding in a really short period of time. And I don't, I, I don't like citing them as having anything to do with skateboarding hitting the mainstream, but like going to the first X Games in Rhode Island in 95, like it was, it was weird to see that. When we went to the X Games, the first X Games in, in Rhode Island, it was a shock. 
It was everything I didn't want us to turn into was that. The skate course looked like a children's playground. It, and I mean, it was called the Extreme Games, come on, you know? Like, you couldn't get it more wrong among skateboarders than that. The thing about paying dues is that skate companies had put a lot into skateboarding when there was not a lot of money to be made. They brought skateboarding up to a point where ESPN wanted to cover skateboarding. Because ESPN, they're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart, they're doing it to make money. It's business, it's capitalism. But it happened, the skateboarding was good, and within the year they changed the name, so by 1996 it was now the X Games which was slightly more palatable. When you dropped in to run two, the, the crowd, the fans were already in a frenzy. The media were looking for you know, the icons and the heroes to tell the stories about, and of course, Tony was still on top of his game, and so became the face of skateboarding. Some people didn't want ESPN to come in and take advantage of skateboarding, but then another part was appreciative and understood that, hey, look, skateboarding needs the exposure that these people can offer. The good that came out of X Games was that we were able to reach a new audience. The only fans of skateboarding in the 80s and the 90s, early 90s, the only people who enjoyed skateboarding or watching skateboarding were skaters themselves. And suddenly, skateboarding was in your living room. And it was, it was a sports event to watch. The X Games chose to add best trick event to their 99 event. And what that means is for 20 minutes, you watch people mostly just falling, trying impossibly hard maneuvers. But in that event, more tricks happened early on than in any other best trick event. And that was not usual. Early on in this event, Tony surprised even himself pulling off an incredible varial 720, which was a trick that would probably have won the contest anyway. I had landed my best trick. Up to that point in my life, that was the best trick I could do. So I thought, that's it, that's, that's what I came here for. I'm done. But there was still a ton of time left on the clock. And this is when the announcer got in Tony's ear saying, do that 900, because he knew I'd been trying it. And I thought, all right, I'll show you what a 900 looks like. I'm not gonna, there's no way I'm gonna make it. When Tony was attempting this feat, this 900, two and a half rotations, this was the first time the mainstream really got to see how difficult these moves are to actually pull off. Nobody could have foreseen was about to happen at this event. I started trying it. I tried maybe three or four. And realized very quickly that I, I can do this now. I've, felt, I've fallen forward, I've fallen backwards, split the difference, and that's it. At this point, the contest is over, but Tony Hawk is showing no signs of quit. All of us are at home, glued to our TVs. We are right there in the battle with Tony. When the time ran out, I wasn't even bothered by that because in skateboarding, you're gonna just keep trying it. At its core, skating is DIY and it's renegade and it's passion. And I think that that's what people saw there that night because that's, that's exactly what it was. It was like, I don't care if you turn off the cameras and I didn't care if I got hurt, I was doing it at the core of it, it's the same as anyone trying to learn how to do a kickflip. It's just these small adjustments, and it's the perseverance, and it's the determination that get you there. That's the skate mentality. You're gonna just keep trying against all odds. And even if that's just for yourself, that's good enough. You're gonna keep trying until you do it. Eventually you get it. The, the elation someone feels when they land their first kickflip is probably the same that I felt doing 900. I, I remember when I made it, 
I still kind of didn't believe that it happened. And I went up the next wall and realized I was still on my skateboard. And then I, I turned and I saw all of my peers running towards me on the ramp. And that's when it became a reality. There was still a part of me that thought, no one's gonna care. <laughs> no, one, no one cared when I did a 720 in 1985. Like the skate world did, but, but it didn't make news. It didn't matter in the grand scheme of things. And so it was, I just did it for myself. The stoke of this moment in skateboarding changed all of us. Uh, this was truly a time where the mainstream, the rest of the world, could get a real look at raw skateboarding at its best. I think that the whole the event was an opportunity for mainstream to really look at what this culture was doing. That was one of the best things in like Getting to see the work that this guy was putting in to make, the, make it happen. I don't think it could have been written any more perfect. And what it has meant to skateboarding thereafter has, uh, has done nothing but benefit the culture. It's just the X Games, man. Like, is it gonna matter 10 years from now? Well, I guess it does, but. I guess the worst thing is that they get credit for the place that that happened. I mean, in my eyes, you know, that would be like, why didn't it just happen like, somewhere like where we all skate or where, where skateboarding gets to claim it as like, this happened here. But it also wouldn't have made a big deal like it did to the whole world. You know, so Tony made careers for a lot of people. So we have him to thank for it. When that 900 happened, that was a breakthrough and I didn't, I wasn't surprised. I'm like, of course. Anytime you mention skateboarding, people are just like, Tony Hawk, Tony Hawk, you know? And like, that's what it was, you know? like. He paved the way for all of us to make a little bit of money, and there's even more you can do. There's a video game, you know? It broke down barriers that we never thought were possible. Tony was not just sort of the top skateboarder, but he also had this blockbuster video game, and those things together really created the celebrity we know of as Tony Hawk. This video game was really, I think for a lot of people, the first exposure to skateboarding. And so you started to see more people, more kids trickle into the sport. And so skating really took off. I did a 900 at the X Games and our video game became a top seller. And suddenly there was a lot of interest in skateboarding. It was like, I want to skateboard, I want to go skate. And it was like, where are you going to go? There's <laughs> good luck. There were no parks. That sudden hype for skateboarding did not translate to skate parks being built. Most kids just didn't have a place to go. And there were a few cities looking to build skate parks, looking to find a solution to this growing number of kids who were skating, but getting in trouble for it because they didn't have a sanctioned place to do it. And so you started to see more cities try it out. And of course, not everybody understood how to do it. When we would plan tours, like early 2000s, there were very few cities to choose from because those were the cities that had skate parks. So our routing was like, okay, we're gonna go over here and then we're gonna go up the coast to here and try to hit this one in the Midwest and try to, because there was just a lack of parks. And so it was weird. There was this huge interest. We were getting thousands of people at these skate parks to watch us, but there were only a handful of skate parks. That was the catalyst for starting a foundation for public skate parks. That was like 2000, 2001, when I saw this explosion of interest and a lack of facilities, and I thought I could bridge that gap. You know, with that platform, he understood he had a voice to share what he understood about skateboarding and to really bring a lot of attention to things like the lack of places to skate. He saw an opportunity to take his fame and some of the fortune he was making at that time and dedicate it to a cause. And for him, the cause was creating skate parks, creating safe, sanctioned places for kids to go and skate and do this thing that's inherently healthy. And so, you know, when Tony started the foundation, it was a pretty simple idea. To have a public facility that you don't have to pay to use is hugely important. Because if you have a place where you have to pay to use, you're just being elitist. 
and you're excluding so many people that could thrive there. For those first 10 years, there was a lot of work put into making the case for why the community needed a skate park. It was a lot of uphill political battle uh, back then, particularly with some of these older entrenched politicians who had their concept of public recreation, which was basically stick and ball sports. You know, the same paradigm that everybody has been using since the 1950s. But obviously things change and, you know, there's a lot of pushback initially. A lot of cities still had this old stigma that like skaters are outcasts, they're troublemakers. And that was a big push in those days, making city councils understand how it would benefit their communities. You need to show people who you are, why you love this activity, why it's such an important part of your life, and why you need a place to go and do it. With my success and so much attention on skateboarding, I was able to affect change. Like I was able to speak on behalf of skateboarding and the importance of having these facilities. When I first started skateboarding, Del Mar Skate Ranch was where I belonged. That's where I felt like I found my, my family, my non-related bloodline family. And it was never lost on me how lucky I was to have this place to go and skate. You know, I, yes, I got lucky that I grew up in San Diego and that I eventually lived near Del Mar Skate Ranch. And so when I started a foundation, that was my main idea, was that I want a place for these kids to go where they feel like they belong, they can hang out with their friends, they're not kicked out. It was more to have a sense of belonging. And it's still a hard sell. Like, not all of them went for it, and we had to fight that for years, decades, and eventually won them over. I mean, we're talking about thousands of skate parks now. It's pretty incredible to think that Tony's nonprofit from right here in San Diego has done more to help develop free public skate parks all over the country than any other organization on the planet. You know, the foundations done work in every state. It's helped provide these skate parks and help get behind the communities, empower them to do what, what they're trying to do and ensure that all the work they were doing would result in a quality skate park. You know, you don't want them to repeat what the guys in the 70s did. It's a very specific skill. I think now cities have to build skate parks. It's a civic thing now, is you, you've gotta have a skate park. It's like having a basketball court or a dog park. You, know, you gotta have it. And the whole thing where you have a fence around it and you put a toll booth up at the front, it doesn't really work. It's all great. I think that public parks, just the acknowledgement that skateboarding's there and we need to do something about it, and then to see the response from the communities once they do that, it's really good. And I went out trying to create a skateboarding as a paid entertainment, and I think that that's not the way it's supposed to be. You know, you don't have to pay to ride a wave. Uh, you shouldn't have to pay to sky ride a skateboard. I think it's a great activity for anybody to be involved in. I mean, I've seen it change families. You know, I've seen it change kids' lives. And, you know, a lot of women, girls, have started in the skate parks. And just having skate parks gives all these kids more of a chance to go skateboarding. I'm so stoked that it's become an accepted thing for girls to be skating. The girls themselves decided, you know what? I'm just gonna skate. I don't care what people think of me. I don't care what people say. I'm gonna go skate. These girls are amazing and they're skating now. They're not skating like a girl. They're skating. The state of women's skateboarding today is better than ever. I can only assume that the free skate parks is helping to support women in skating because they can just show up 
and they don't have to go through a whole process and be vetted and sign waivers and pay and the idea that it's open to them goes a long way. You know, the proliferation of skate parks in California led to the proliferation of skate parks across the country and then abroad, as influence goes culturally, right? And so you're seeing skate parks all through certainly North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Middle East. I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, the fact that it's in the Olympics means it's a sport that's, that's practiced on every continent. And what Tony started was, you know, a simple idea, but the impact has been profound. It's almost like the whole skate park is another family that you can only really, really meet if you go there day in and day out. Like you'll meet someone and you'll see them skateboard and we all have something in common. I basically feel like every person in San Diego at every Google skate park is a part of my family. It's just grown to where skateboarding is accepted. People don't go, oh, you're a skateboarder? You know. No, my son's a skateboarder, my nephew's a skateboarder, my grandson's a skateboarder. I skated, you know. It's not a weird thing anymore to be a skateboarder, you know. It's weird not to skateboard. In a lot of sports, you enter the court or the field and you have your ball or your, your bat and there's a specific thing you're allowed to do and, and a lot of things you're not allowed to do. And in skateboarding, you walk into a, a huge skateboard park and there are no rules. It's like, come in and here you go, kid. Make a decision the moment you step through the threshold. Where are you gonna go? What are you gonna do? It's up to you. No one's telling you, there's no coaches, no pressure. And these kids, they learn to navigate these parks and they put together their own lines based on what they can do and what's fun for them. And they keep going. and. The skate park offers endless opportunities for that. The drive to always be a better person is crystallized in skateboarding. You do something and you fall down, and then what do you do? You get up and you do it again. that kind of determination to go through something that causes you pain, emotional pain, physical pain, and the pride that it comes from the meeting the challenge and passing through the challenge is like nothing that anybody can hand you. I mean, that's a different kind of person. Those are my favorite kind of people. I hope San Diegans are aware of the impact that San Diego skateboarders have had on the whole culture. Skateboarding benefited from the influence of San Diego skaters. The evolution of skating was accelerated because of San Diego. Everyone contributed in their own way, but collectively, it was a huge push for skateboarding. Kids that go to the skate park for the first time, even if they're not there to skate, they're, they're drawn to it. And that's how I felt for someone to the skate park. That was it, I vividly remember it and I feel like that experience happens over and over and over. Kids go to the park and they're like, did he really just jump down those stairs? I want a skateboard. And that's all it takes. <laughs>